Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Thank you so much for the beautiful, special music. Uh, and we just want to welcome each and every one of you for coming out uh, to this morning um, for our Daniel Revelation continuation seminar. Uh, we're coming down to a close. Uh, as some of us may have known or may have not known, we've been here for the past uh, two weeks in studying the books of Daniel and Revelation. And how many of us have, has it been a, a blessing for you guys? Amen? All right. So uh, before we begin, we will start off again with a word of prayer, and then we'll go into our daily uh, quizzes. So let's bow our heads for a short word of prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath morning that you have blessed us with. We want to thank you so much, Father, for bringing us here to worship you in spirit and in truth. And, Father, we want to invite your Holy Spirit to be present with us as we go into our quiz and as we also study your word. We ask, Father, that the Holy Spirit would be our true guide and our true teacher, that he may lead us and guide us into all truth, that the truth shall set us free. Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord, for never giving up upon us. Even though many times we have turned our backs upon you, Lord, you never did turn your back on us. And so, Lord, we praise you and thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your mercies, which are renewed every morning, and your compassions that fail it not. Lord, please bless us in our worship this morning. May you be praised and lifted up. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to start off our, our Daniel Revelation seminar uh, with a, our nightly quiz. So, I mean, good morning quiz. <laughs> we have three questions um, today, and the questions are going to be about last night's presentation about the two beasts of Revelation chapter 13. So we have three questions about Revelation 13. Basically, you have two beasts. You have the sea beast and you have the earth beast in, these, in this chapter. And again, whoever answers the question, uh, they will get a prize. Uh, Renz has the prizes as well. It's, it's not a big prize, but it's a little uh, Bible bookmark that we have. And uh, the prizes will go to those whoever answers the question. And again, if you've answered the question in the past, you are exempted from today's quiz. Amen? <laughs> All right, so let's start off with our first question for our quiz. And the first question is, oh, by the way, it, when you have the answer, um, there is a microphone in the front here. Just come up to the front, grab the microphone, and then share um, the answers with us. I think somebody is going to be uh, having the microphone. All right, first question. Number one, what is the central issue in the last days. If you could summarize it in one word, what is the central issue in the last days? Huh? Worship. Worship, correct. She got it right. Congratulations. The central issue in the last days is worship is worship. She got it correct. Congratulations on answering our first quiz questions, and Renz will be giving you uh, your prize. All right, question number two. We're going to move on to the next question. The next question is, in Revelation 13, who is the identity of the sea beasts? In Revelation chapter 13, who is the identity of the sea beasts? Any hands? In Revelation chapter 13, who is the identity of the sea beast? What power, what kingdom is the identity of the sea beast? Remember, there is a sea beast and an earth beast. What is the identity of the sea beast, the first beast that arises? Anyone? Huh? 
Rome, correct. The identity of the sea beast is Rome. The sea beast represents Rome or papal Rome in its two stages. You're going to see in Revelation 13 that there's, a, there's two stages going on here. The first stage is the little horn power in the dark ages that happened from 538 until 1798. Uh, 1798, and then the second stage is when the little horn power rises again in the last days. Remember in 1798, papal Rome received its deadly wound, meaning to say uh, the king at that time was taken uh, captive by General Berthier, French General Berthier, and was led into exile until he died. And as a result, from 1798 until now, the, this is the period where the deadly wound is basically not ruling, but it will one day in the future be healed. The deadly wound will be healed, and that little horn power is that same little horn power in the last days. This is, of course, in the future. All right, so good job. Congratulations on answering the question. Our third question, our final and third question is, give two of the six characteristics of the sea beasts. Give two of the six of the characteristics of the sea beasts. This is in Revelation chapter 13. What are the characteristics of the sea beasts? Just give two. Anyone? Is, is this a hard question? <laughs> All right, looks like we have someone. Yes, correct. Congratulations, she got it correct. So the answer is, number one, they have authority from pagan Rome. Number two, they have a worldwide religious power. Number three, it equates itself to God. Number four, it is a persecuting power. Number five, it reigned for 1,260 years. That is known as the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages from 538 to 1798. And it is also the one who has, who has the mark of the beast as well. So congratulations on everyone for taking our quiz, our short quizzes. Um, just a short reminder, uh, tomorrow, um, tomorrow night would be our last night of our Daniel and Revelation seminar. And uh, in this last seminar tomorrow night, we're not going to have a typical sermon we're going to have a panel discussion uh, on any questions that you may have about the books of Daniel and Revelation. So any questions about prophecy, we're going to have a seminar tomorrow, uh, a panel discussion rather, and just basically answering any question that you may have. And I believe Mom Barreto has uh, the list of questions that she will give us today. And then by tomorrow, we can hopefully give you the answers um, on the screen. And we'll also open it up to the floor, whoever has any questions. And by the way, tomorrow we're going to have uh, our Daniel and Revelation seminar start a little bit early. So instead of 7, because the reason why is because on Monday, um, many of us have our first day of classes. Are you guys excited for those classes? <laughs> I see a lot of smiles. Okay, so... On Monday, we have our first day of classes starting up and uh, of the new semester. So we want to kind of finish earlier than the normal time expe expected. So we will start at 6 p.m. Uh, tomorrow night. What time, everyone? 6 p.m. So instead of 7, one hour earlier, 6 p.m., and we will have a uh, panel discussion for those questions. All right. And if you guys have any more questions that you wanted to ask, feel free to ask uh, Renz or myself or any one of the, the COT team as well if you have any more questions about Dan Rev. All right, at this moment, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Renz. And by the way, 
Um, Renz ha has the gifts from last night. How many? There were three people that took the quiz last night, Deba. Right? Renz has your gifts. If you do have, uh, if you have answered the questions last night and got it correct, please see Renz after the sermon, and he will give it to you guys. Okay. So right now we're gonna turn it over to Brother Renz. Happy Sabbath, friends. Um, I want to share a little confession. Last night, after I shared God's word, I got down and I looked at my phone and the time was 8.52. I didn't realize how long I had been speaking. Um, so today, I brought my phone and not to text, not to play, but I brought a timer so that I can keep watch of the time. Right now it's 10.44, so we have until 12 o'clock, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Um, but I brought a timer so at least I have an idea of how long I have been speaking. So last night we talked about the beasts, the two beasts, the characteristic, not specifically who it is, but rather we focus more on the characteristics of the beasts. And it is very important to our message today, which is the proclamation of the three angels. Now, before we begin our message, I'd like to invite everyone. As I pray, we're going to pray, but I'd like to invite you to have a personal prayer to the Lord and invite the Holy Spirit to touch your heart as well as to guard it. That this time, as we listen to the message, because the message is very powerful, but as well very sensitive, just like last night. And so that we would have an open mind and an open heart to receive the blessing from God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. For you have given us the Sabbath so that we could communion and fellowship with you, Lord. We thank you for you are a God who seeks who runs after and who longs for his children to be together. And Lord, today, as we gather as your people in your humble home, we know, Lord, that you are in our midst. And we ask the Holy Spirit to please touch our hearts, to please manifest within us, that we will be able to receive the blessing in store today. This is our prayer. Amen. So I'm gonna start the timer right now. And today, as you can see, we are talking about the proclamation of the three angels. Before we go into the word, I wanna share a little story. There was once a medical practitioner, a doctor, and he went to a mission field and he dedicated 40 years of his life to medical mission. So 40 years, you can imagine, as a medical student, if they were able to go to school without delay and finish, they would probably finish around 25 years old. So 40 years, they would be, if they went straight to the mission, they would be 65, 70 years old at this time. So he has been serving for 40 years, and he thought to himself, as much as I love to stay here for the rest of my life and serve the people, I think it's time for me to rest. It's time for me to go home. And so he, he went and catch the first boat that he could find. And as he was planning to go home, he was so excited because he could just imagine being away for 40 years, his family and his friends would be very excited to see him return. His family and friends would probably, he was imagining how if he get to the docks, that there would be people with banners welcoming him and, and cherishing the moment of his homecoming. And so he sent a letter ahead, way ahead, to inform his family and to inform his friends, 
saying that he will ride the ship, the certain ship, and it will come at a certain time and at a certain dock, a certain place. And when he got to the docks, to his excitement, there was a bunch of people, a, a huge amount of people with banners that says, welcome home, glad that you traveled safely, welcome back, you are glad to that you're here. And they were cheering and they were enjoying and they were having a good time because they were excited to see him, or at least he thought they were. With his excitement, he was about to run and greet them, but the first step that he took out of the boat, he realized that the homecoming was not for him. And right behind him, there was a commotion. There was a man with full of bodyguards, and it turned out that there was a celebrity in the same ship that he was riding in. And the homecoming was not for him, but it was for the celebrity. And so he saw the docks, and even though there were so many people, to him it was empty. And he couldn't help but look up to heaven and say to God, God, I've spent majority of my life serving my fellow man. Can I not even get one person to celebrate me? And it, in the quietness of the moment, it's as if he heard God reply to him saying, my son, you're not home yet. When you're home, I will give you a welcome. When you're home, I will give you a party. We will have a celebration. We will have a banquet. The angels will sing and people will play the trumpet and music will go on to celebrate you being home. And someday we will get to heaven. The question, friends, is, are we there yet? Are we there yet? As of now, we're still here, so no, we're not there yet. So while we, get, while we wait for us to get there, while we wait for us to get there, what is it that we're supposed to do? We are now living in the last days. We know that because we've learned it through the past two weeks. And very soon, we are going to be home. But there is one last thing that needs to happen before we get home, and that is the proclamation of the three angels' message. The last, last, meaning the last episode, the last chapter, the last part of our story here on earth then we will have a new life in heaven. Before we go directly to, the, to Revelations 14, where it talks about um, the, in, the three angels' message, let's have a review of the timeline that we've learned so far. We begin in Daniel chapter 2, but if we look at Daniel 7, we have the, the kingly or the beastly kingdoms, right? The beast kingdoms. So the first one was the lion and the eagle, which represents Babylon, right? So the first one represents Babylon, which reigned in 605 BC to 539 BC. There was the bear with the three ribs on his mouth, which represents Medo-Persia, which reigned in 539 to 331 BC. Afterwards, there was the leopard, which represents which kingdom? Greece which reigned in 331 to 168 BC. After that, there was the Roman Empire, which is the, the dragon, the unimaginable, treacherous beast that even Daniel could not describe. But specifically about the dragon, it had 10 horns. And in one of those, and in, out of those 10 horns, came out a little horn. And how many horns did the, the little horn plucked out for it to rise up? Three. So in history, we know that these three horns represents the Hemuli, the Vandals, and the Ostagoths. So these three kingdoms, which is part of the divided Rome, they were taken down by the little horn before the little horn rose up in power. And we know as well that this 
story in Daniel 7 is not just in Daniel 7. Where else can it be found? It can be found in Revelation 13, when there was the beast that had a body of a leopard with the face of a lion and feet like a bear, represents the previous um, beast in Daniel 7. Represents the previous beast in Daniel 7. And it also had 10 horns, and each horn had the crown. So if you look at the verses, it says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like feet of a bear, and his mouth like a mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power and his throne a great authority. So who's the dragon again? Just reviewing. The dragon is Satan. And Satan gave authority to the beast, which is papal Rome. And we know this because um, both the little horn and the sea beast did the same things. They blasphemed God's name and authority as well as persecuted the saints of the Most High. How many years did they persecute the saints? 1,260 years. So if you look here in Daniel 7:25, it says time, times, and half a time. So meaning one time, times meaning more than one, so two, and then half a time is half. So one, two, three, and half. So three and a half years, or in other words, 42 months, which is we can see in Revelation 13, which if we turn, if we calculate it from prophetic uh, prophetic time, prophetic days to literal years, we end up with 1,260 years. But it's interesting that in Revelation 13, it didn't end with just the little horn. There was something that came after. Right? So this is the pa parallel between the two beasts. And we can see in Revelation 13, uh, verse 11, now, I wasn't able to touch on this last night because of the time limit. And today, I we won't be focusing much on it either. But I just want to touch briefly on it, just very briefly. It says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. So this beast, it had two horns like a lamb. So it had the characteristic of a lamb. What does a lamb represent? Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ, the lamb represents Christianity. And having two horns, it means that it had, we'll talk about the two horns um, even more. But what's important right now is that it had characteristics of a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. So it's a Christian power or authority or nation, but the, but the intent of this, this power is of the dragon. So, so this is just an image, but we can see, now again, I, I, we don't have time to go deeper into it, but to summarize it very, very briefly, it is believed, and we know through the studies, when, when did the 1,260 days finish? It finished in the year 1798. And during that time, in the late 1700s, the nation that we know today as the United States of America rose up in power. It rose up in power. So that's the first evidence. But more so than the time that they rose up, let's look the two horns. So the two horns represent, what again? Christianity, right? Jesus Christ. So these two horns actually represents republicanism. In other words, having the liberty of a citizen having a liberty of a people, as well as Protestantism, which is the liberty of your religion. So this nation is very unique because it both, it, uh, in separation, it has civil and religious liberty. There's a quote from Ellen White that says, the Protestants of the United States will be the foremost in stretching their hands across the Gulf to grasp the hands of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp the 
to clasp hands with the Roman power, and under the influence of the threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. So the same things that happened during the past, if we look in the story of King Nebuchadnezzar and how he said, worship the image. And we look in the story of the little horn and the, and the sea beast of worship and when they persecuted Christians during the dark ages, the same thing will happen in the future and it is between the, uni the union of United States and the Roman power. What else is said? The land beast is actually if the reactivation of the sea beast. We learned last night that we begin with the sea beast. And who gave the sea beast authority? The dragon. The dragon giving authority to the sea beast and the sea beast sending the earth beast to continue its mission, right? So this is the false image of the Trinity. So an apparent third player, Trinity, in the false end time Trinity takes a leading and visible role in its behalf. Remember when the Bible said that it experienced a deadly wound, but it will be risen again. It will be healed. And, and the same power and the same things that it has been doing in the past, it will do it again. So how does this affect us? Well, let's look. We learned, I think, Wednesday about the 144,000. In Revelations chapter 14, verses 1 to 5, these are the characteristics of the 144,000. In there, we can find that they are standing in Mount Zion with the Lamb. Where is Mount Zion? Or what is Mount Zion? Mount Zion is a symbolism of the New Jerusalem. And who is the Lamb? Jesus Christ. So the, the, the 144 standing in heaven with Jesus Christ. They, the name is on their forehead. Unlike we learned last night, the beast puts his name not just on the forehead, but as well as on the hand. So they are deceiving and forcing, but Jesus Christ, the 144, they are not deceived, but rather they believe in the true message. The in their instruments are always ready. They're carrying harps and trumpets, and they sang a new song that only they can sing. They are spiritually pure with no deceits. Now I want to ask you, is this our time now today? Are the 144 on earth today? We don't know. We don't know who they are. They could be because we know that they will not experience death and they will be raised up in heaven with Jesus Christ. So they could be one of us here today. But we don't know for sure because what we do know is that this image or this idea here happens already in heaven. So we have the timeline from Babylon all the way to pig, uh, people row. And then all of a sudden, Revelation 14 jumps to the people, the holy people of God, the saints of God standing with him in Mount Zion. So today we're going to learn about what's happening in between of those. So that is what the three angels' message is all about. Let's look at the first message. It says there, Revelation 14, verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Let's look at the word gospel. What does gospel mean? Good news. It means good news. So when you have good news, let's say, let's look at a newspaper. Every, back home, I, there was a time where I was able to work as a newspaper boy, and I would be working um, once a week, or once or twice a week, and I would be right, walking around the neighborhood, and I will put uh, newspapers in every house. So, and there will be a few of us doing that, and every day they would get a newspaper. And they will receive this newspaper, and in it they will look and find there will be good news, 
but there will also be bad news, right? But the thing was, does the news last forever? Is it the same forever? No, because there's always a brand new newspaper the following day, right? So that's what, the gospel, that's what a good news means, or that's what news in general means. But this angel proclaims an everlasting gospel. So if you put the two together, this news is not only a good news, but it is a news that will last for a lifetime. Who do we know is the good news? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for you and for me. And he didn't just die for you one time, or rather, the effect of his death. The, the blessing that will come out of his death is not just an effect that, will, that we will receive one time, but it is a blessing that we will experience everlasting. Amen? If we look in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, the Christ, Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches us that there is only one person that could die for our sins so that we could go to heaven. But this beast and the Roman Catholic Church is teaching the opposite. It's telling the people that there is a God here on earth. There is a man who is equal with God. And not only that, that this man, as well as all of his priests, has the power and has the authority to forgive your sins. Would you rather have a man give you your salvation or would you rather have a man tell you and assure you of your salvation or would you have the living God tell you that you have salvation? Would you rather believe a man or would you rather believe God himself? That is the question today. What is the central conflict? It is worship. Do we worship the worldly system or do we worship the heavenly divine system? What else does the first angel say? Saying with a loud voice. Saying with a loud voice. When someone shouts at you, what does it mean? They're serious that it's important that there's a very serious and it cannot delay a message that cannot be delayed and so saying with a loud voice fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and the springs of water fear God and give glory to him we learned this last night and simply it is the, the action of being respectful and recognizing God's glory his divine authority over mankind because he is our creator and our redeemer. Therefore, we are to fear him and give him glory. Do you understand now, or is it kind of piecing together why we first had to learn everything in the past before we learn about the three angels' message and why three angels' message is the central and most important piece of our faith? Because this is our mission. When someone lives without a purpose, without meaning, are they really living? Probably not. But for us, we live and we wait. We are Seventh-day Adventists. And we believe in this because we know that there is a living God. And we are to fear Him and give Him glory. What else does it say? For the hour... Sorry, it went forward. Okay. Let's go to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is the true and proper way of worship. So is worship going to the church and paying your tithes and your offerings? It's part of it, but is it the whole thing? No. Is, is, is worship all about making sure that someone else comes to church every Sabbath? No. It's part of it, 
but it's not the whole thing. And it's not even the central thing. You see, even if you do everything that the Bible tells you, but you do it not for God, then you're not really worshiping at all. There's a quote that I heard once that said, if salvation is all about keeping the commandments, then there was no point of Jesus dying on the cross. Jesus understood that there's no way for you and me to be saved from this sinful world. And he understood that to the point that he was willing to come here on earth so that he could do for us what we will never be able to do. Jesus is so loving and so kind. If we look in Psalms 118, verse 6, David says, The Lord is on my side, and I will not fear, for what can man do to me? As I was listening to the messages this past week, because I wasn't preaching all of them, so just like you, I was also a listener. Even though I already knew about those messages, every time I hear them and every time I studied it, every time I review it, it always scares me. Have you had an opportunity to look through the history of the Dark Ages? If you haven't, I want you, I, I encourage you to take a moment to do so. And if, and when you do, imagine that you and I possibly will be going, if, if, if by God's will we're still living during that time, possibly we will be going through the same things, if not worse. It is a scary thought where people will run after you just because and simply just because you believe in Jesus Christ. People will run after you simply because you believe in God. Simply because you have a different belief than them. And today, things like that can already be seen. We are already scratching the tip of the iceberg, as people would like to say. And very soon, the iceberg will not only be scratched, but it will break open and lift up, and the whole dark ages will be repeated again. But aren't we glad that it doesn't end there? Aren't we glad that we already know the, the end of the story? That we already know that the 144 will be standing with the Lamb in the Mount Zion. Amen? And we're looking forward to that time. We go on to what else the first angel says. He says that the hour of His judgment shall come. I'm not sure if we were able to tackle this next um, part. But I think you guys have an idea what the Day of Atonement means. If you want to look at your Bibles, it's found in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 26 to 28. But in, sim in, in summary, the Day of Atonement is a yearly practice, a yearly festival of the Israelite nation. And God told Moses, once a year, you will set a time where you will fast, you will pray, and all that you will be doing is put your focus in asking God for forgiveness. And not only asking Him for forgiveness, but also inviting Him to live through you for another year and for the rest of your life. The hour of judgment will come upon this earth, and now is the spiritual time of the Day of Atonement. Now is the spiritual time where it, for us, we are to go to God and cry to Jesus, our mediator. Remember what Timothy says? One mediator, one God. And we are to cry to him and ask him for forgiveness. And that he would live in us so that we will be ready for his return. Can you imagine? Not only is God coming for us to take us home, but he is also preparing us for his return. I, I, I'm reminded of the story of Abraham where, where 
I can't remember it word for word, but God tells Abraham, God tells Abraham, I will make a covenant with you. And in, in simpler words, he basically says, he basically says, and before we go on, does anyone, or we know what covenant means, right? It is an agreement between two parties where one party will do something for another and will, the other party will also do something for the other. So there is a covenant between God and Abraham. And in simple words, God basically says, I will fulfill my part of the covenant and I will send Jesus Christ that you could also fulfill yours. Amen? We don't have anything that we need to do other than to trust in his promise. The first angel also says to worship him. And worshiping him, as we learned um, two nights ago, is found in the seal of God. In the, ten, in the fourth commandment, from the Ten Commandments, the name, the title, and the territory is found there. God, our creator of all the heaven and all the earth. So that is how we worship Him. So in an essence, the first message calls us to give Him the glory due to Him as our Creator and as our Redeemer. And the first message also says He announces that we are living in the hour of investigative judgment that will culminate in the verdict of eternal life or eternal loss for everyone. Finally, the first angel's message reminds us that God alone is sovereign. He alone is worthy of worship. You and me being here today is receiving this message right now. This whole time that we are living as Christians, every message that we are hearing is all about heaven. There is there's a mega church pastor and he wrote a book. I'm not going to mention his name, but you might know him. He wrote a book that says the seven ways to have the best life, something like that. The seven ways to have the best life here on earth. And then there was one critic, or not really critic, more like a, someone commented, a pastor speaking and commented and said, that book is 100% true. That book is 100% true and I will recommend it to you to read it if you want to have the best life here on earth but have no life for the rest of your eternity. The message is not found from any other man in this world. The message is not found from any other book in this world. The message is only found, sorry, going ahead. The message is only found in the Bible telling us that God is worthy of our worship and his time of judgment is coming soon. Let's go to the second angel. Revelations 14 verse 8. Another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine, the wrath of her fornication. First line says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Do we know the history of Babylon? Where does Babylon come from? It comes from the book of Genesis, the story of the Tower of Babel, where, and the, and the image is all about rebellion against God, where the humankind want, didn't want to live under God's law anymore. They didn't want to follow him because they thought he was scary. They were fearing him in the wrong way. And so they said, we will create a place so that we could be safe from his wrath. Can a man ever be safe from God's wrath? No. If he created you, he also knows how to destroy you. But we are thankful because God is not like that. And he will give us chances and chances until probation is closed to return to him and let him work in our lives. So, so Babylon comes from the Tower of Babel babbling. So it's all about confusion. This, this nation, the Babylon, the, the, the worship of confusion where people are not working along together. And so we look, 
the next part is that this Babylon is not only a, a, a nation or a power of confusion, but it is also a great city. In Revelation 17, this is the description or this is the name or the title of Babylon. So the woman, on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. This is, in an essence, in summary, the title of the enemy. This is her title. And what is the description of this woman? Well, let's go back one verse. In verse 4, it says, The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls and having in her, in her hand a golden cup full of abomination and the filthiness of her fornication. So I want you to keep in mind the purple, the scarlet, and the gold as well as the golden cup. Okay? This image, those three colors, purple, scarlet, and gold, is actually found on the same colors that God has instructed his priests during the Israelite time to, to clothe themselves with. The priestly garments. Let's look at what the Bible says. In Exodus 39, verse 8, he made the breastplate artistically woven like the mark, mark, workmanship of the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and a fine linen, woven linen. So the three colors are found there, right? But there is one more that is not included in the woman. And in the Bible, the blue, the color blue, is represented by God's commandments. So this woman has every characteristics of God, but his commandments, and not only that, this Babylon, this mystery, also has the cup of abomination. Meaning to say, everything that, the, that Babylon, this woman is trying to do, is the complete parallel of God minus the commandments. So when we live on earth, do we live by the commandments alone? Do we live for the sole purpose of living and fulfilling the commandments? No. We are to live fulfilling everything that is in them. The character of Jesus, the fulfillment of the law. But fulfillment of the law is, is the result of believing in Jesus Christ. But to just give you a picture, this, this woman or this Babylon is trying to make him, herself like God while abolishing the law. It's missing blue or the law. So Babylon, the second message, is instructing us, telling us that the great city of Babylon who had done nothing but tried to deceive and pull away people from worshiping the true God to worship the Babylon, we are being instructed to leave that place. We have learned about the future that we have, and now we are, the second message is all about doing what is not, not doing what is wrong here on earth. And that is living in that great Babylon. The third angel's message, Revelation 14, 9 and 10 says, a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worship the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, what does these two words mean again? Receiving the mark on the forehead and the hand. Forehead represents deceiving and hand represents coercing or forcing. So the beast will, or the image, the beast and his image will try and deceive and force people to turn away from God. It goes on and says, whoever is deceived, whoever is, allows himself to be coerced, he himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out in full strength into the cup of his indignation.
when um, I remember there was a time when I was still in Canada and we were traveling from from our, from our home and we were going to one of our friend's house and in our car in our car as we were traveling my dad was driving and he started to notice that he started to notice how the car the car's engine wasn't working properly the car's engine wasn't you know it wasn't revving as high it wasn't going as fast as it normally does and then later on he brought it to the shop and then he asked the mechanic what's wrong with the car and then the mechanic simply says um, he looked at the he looked at the engine he opened up the hood and looked at the engine and the engine were missing a part I forgot what it was exactly but he said that there's no way for your engine or for your vehicle to work in its full capacity if even one part of the engine is missing. So today here on earth, when God punishes or when God uses His wrath, He doesn't actually use 100% of it. Do you, have you heard of the, the term, God loves the sinner but hates the sin? In that way, God cannot ever function His full wrath on us because as much as He hates our sin, He can never destroy us because of His love for us. That's why He keeps holding back. That's why He keeps controlling or, or suppressing His powers, His wrath. Because as much as He hates the sin in us, He loves us as his children but the third angels message saying that someday if you do not leave Babylon for now you still have the chance we still have the chance but someday if we don't leave Babylon we allow ourselves to be deceived to be forced we will experience the full wrath of God meaning to say even in his love for us, he cannot hold himself back anymore. You know why he cannot hold himself back? And I think I'm going a little ahead on my presentation. But in order for him, I want to ask you, do you want to live in a place where there's no more death, no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering? If you want to live in that place, there's only one God that can create that place again the same God who created this perfect world in the beginning and you see he didn't want to start from scratch but he wanted to work with what he can and in order for him to do that he must eradicate all possible sins in this world that means including the ones who choose not to turn their face back to God that's why we are saying, that's why the, uh, we are proclaiming this message now because we do not know the time when the probation will be closed. So it's better to be ready, just like the ten virgins, it's better to be ready like the five who had oils in their lamps, who has Jesus in their life, unlike those who were sleeping and thinking they will still have enough when Jesus returns. That's why it is uh, important to have a daily communion, daily connection, relationship with God. Because we do not want to experience the full wrath of God. The full wrath is a picture. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Does this ring a bell to anyone? We are reminded of the story in Sodom and Gomorrah where God saw in that city in those cities the people that were committing sins <clears throat> he saw that there was no way for them to turn back to him 
as much as he tried. You see, he sent Lot. Lot and his family went to that place. And God could have used Lot. And I firmly believe that God did try to, to use Lot. Lot offered his, his, his daughters and say, here are my daughters. Please do the right thing so that you will not offend these holy men, which is a representation of God. In the same way today, God is calling you, please do not be deceived by the beast. Because I do, I do not want to, to put my judgment and to put my wrath on you. The same message is being said today. You see, God is love. God is love. We look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He knew that there's no way for us to redeem ourselves. I'm reminded of the story of Barabbas. I was sharing a message a couple of weeks ago. And in my studies, I found out that in the story of Barabbas, Jesus stood there like nothing, even though the whole, na or the whole Jewish people were persecuting him and saying, crucify him. Jesus stood there silently. You know why he stood silently? Because Jesus had to be treated like Barabbas in order for Barabbas to be treated like Jesus. You and me, God looks at us and he looks at you as if we are his personal son, Jesus Christ. And he had to treat Jesus Christ like us to die on the cross so that we could have a chance to go to heaven. That's how much God loves us. Revelations 21 verse 3. It talks about our future. We jump from chapter 14 all the way to 21. And there are many other things that are in there between those chapters. Those are a lot of chapters, six chapters. But in an essence, all it is about are these two next verses. At least this is my personal, personal thought. You see, last year in April, last year in April, I lost my grandmother in April 4, 2019. And six days later, or eight days later, April 12, 2020, I lost my grandfather. My grandmother and his husband, or her husband, grandpa, mama and papa, they passed away in very, a very short span of time. And to, in, in that time, we were trying to have a family reunion. We were trying to get together, um, be together as a family. And I was thinking how painful it was that we couldn't even, like, I was asking God, God, why couldn't you give them a few more weeks so that our family could come together? But then I realized that God wanted them to rest. We didn't know what was wrong with Mama, but later on we found out that she was actually suffering with cancer in her, the doctors found out afterwards. And I was looking at this verse last night and I realized, behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. We will be living on earth or in heaven and we get to live with our God. We get to live with the one who created you, the one who saved you, the one who died for you, and the one who calls you his child. The one who would leave the 99 so that he could save you. The one who would run to you when he sees you running him from leaving for a long time. The one who will offer everything that he could and he will give it to you. That same God, we will be able to live with him someday. And I was imagining I could live with my grandparents up there in heaven someday. God himself will be with them and be their God. We don't need to go to church. You know why? Because we will be living in church. 
We will be living with God. And every day we get to sing a new song to Him. We get to play our instruments and use our voices for His glory. What else does it say? And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I remember that time last year was very tough. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. The former things, it is the things that are happening now, happening in the past. Meaning everything that the enemy tried throughout the years to try and turn us away from God will be completely wiped out. And there is no longer trouble for you and me. So what should we do? What are we to do until that time comes? Can the people of God go to heaven without knowing about heaven? You know how when you go to Manila and it's very traffic, even with the pandemic going on, my aunt said that there's still traffic. And you know, sometimes it's so difficult to maneuver your way into a big city with lots of streets and with no proper directions. But it is important for you to get to a destination, you must have a guide. You and I, my friends, we already know the message of the Bible. Amen? We know what it says. We know what it's talking about. And now it is our turn to share that same message unto the world. This is the calling of the three angels' message. First, it is calling for you to leave Babylon, for you to leave that great city, and at the same time, once you are out of that great city, to try and go back, not to return, but to take as many people as you can and bring them to Jesus. For you to take as many people as you can to lead them to Christ. Because our salvation is not meant just for one individual. But God said, for God so loved one person. For God so loved the world. Therefore, we, as recipients of that love, should be moved to share that love to the rest of the world. Just as Jesus left heaven for you and me. We should also leave our comfort zone, leave our place of comfort to go out and reach other lives. Ellen White says this in Testimonies of the Church. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen. On as, is watchmen an offensive or a defensive term? Defensive. So you stand in a position, a station, and you keep watch. So you're making sure that nothing is going to come your way. So you, we are defensive. But not only are we defensive, we're also light bearers, which are offensive. Light bearers bring the light unto the world. So Ellen White, our sister, is saying to us that we, if we truly are Seventh-day Adventists, not only are we to be defensive against the deceits, deceivement of the enemy, but we are also to be light bearers for the rest of the world. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is the shining wonderful light from the Word of God. Do you believe that you have the blessing of the Word of God? Do you believe you have the power and the opportunity to learn more about the Word of God? Then we are to use that opportunity. We are to use that privilege. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. This is, this last line, is one of my personal struggles. Many times I get lazy and I am distracted of the world. Especially during this pandemic, there's the social media. Sometimes I would tell myself, oh wow. Sometimes I would tell myself, 
I just need, I'm just going to look at the news about the corona, or I'm going to look at the news about the world. But next thing you know, I realize I'm watching a race, I'm watching basketball, I'm watching a music video. And next thing you know, I'm on Facebook. I'm watching cats, I'm watching dogs, I'm watching all different kinds of things. I'm watching a cooking show. I am easily distracted. This is one of my biggest struggles, is that sometimes I allow things to grab my attention. But Sister White is telling us there should be nothing else to absorb our attention than God. I want to end with this story. There is a play that was made in 1959, if I'm not mistaken, and it was entitled A Raisin in the Sun. Raisin. What's the Tagalog of Raisin? Pasas? Pesas? Pasas? Raisin. And the story goes like this. There was a family who was living in Harlem. Harlem is a city in U.S., a very, and during that time, it was a very difficult place to live in. If you live there, more than likely, it's because you were not financially stable. You were poor, and ra going, raising up, you lived poor. And then their family, this family, they lost their father. They lost the dad because of he passed away. We're not sure how, but... Because he passed away, he had insurance over his life. And the insurance was $10,000. And in 1959, is that a lot of money? A lot of money. 1959, $10,000 could be, I'm not sure, but it's a lot of money. The story says that the mother thought to herself, she can finally leave the, the struggles of living in Harlem and they could buy a little house, cozy house, and, and have a new life, comfortable life. So $10,000 is enough to buy you a house during that time and live comfortably after that. The daughter, one of the daughters, were so excited and thought she could finally achieve her dreams to go to medical school. Who here is in the medical field? Not many people. But what we do know is that medical field is very expensive, right? So she thought, I can finally achieve my dream, which I thought was not possible before because we never had the money and there's no way for her to go to school. But now she ha they have the money, $10,000, where she could go to school. But the young man right here, he said, and he, he made a little presentation to his family. <coughs> and he said, mom, dad, or not dad, mom, Sisters, let me take the money. Let me take the money, and I have a friend. We're going to work together. We're going to have a business, and we're going to try and get that money and multiply it over and over again so that all of us, not just me, but all of us could live comfortably. And so with the betterment of her judgment, the mother looked at the young boy and said, okay, if my young boy would go to business and he can multiply his money, then we can send my daughter to school and buy us a house. But long story short, his friend skipped town the following day, meaning he left with all the money. And so this young man had to come home and he had to bear the news to his family. Knowing that it wasn't a good news, he was getting ready for the bickerings and the insults of his family. And he was not wrong. One of his, or one of his sisters started saying bad things about him. And even to the point that saying curse, cursing him, saying, you're such and such, how could you do this to our family, da 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 And then in, 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 her, in her time of bickering and insults to her brother, the mother interrupts her and says, are you done? Are you done? Can you not give him some love? 
And then the sister with her emotion says, love? There's nothing left to love for this man. He took away our hope. He took away everything from us. How can I love this man? And the mother replies, there's always something to love. There's always something to love. I thought I raised you to love. I thought I raised you to, to be kind. And if you think you've learned enough and this is how you are, then you haven't learned anything at all. If you think that this is how life should be, that we get to choose what's right and wrong, then you don't, haven't learned anything at all. Have you even cried for your brother yet? Not as in cry because he lost the money, but think about what he's going through. Think about the, the pressure, the emotion that he's feeling too. Of course he knows what he's done wrong. Have you cried for your brother yet? Friends, there is still something left to love 